that was the first red flag that there were that there were bigger problems in this space, right? When a couple of college dorm room kids start receiving millions of dollars from one of the biggest and oldest companies in America, to me, you know, it indicates that there's an opportunity to to change things for the better. <laughs> You were telling me before we started recording that this is an industry, this medical supply chain industry is something that hasn't changed in ages. You were saying centuries. Yeah. I mean, the biggest players in this space are companies that were established and have dominated for close to 200 years, in some cases, even more. And they're some of the biggest companies in the United States. And frankly, not a lot has changed. And I'm I, I sympathize with with the reasons for for hindering change. I mean, I think a, a small part of every single person adopts the the mentality of if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Sure. And that's especially true when the risks of of change are high, right? And we're talking about healthcare, where change implemented poorly, um, you know, carries the risk of failure. Failure being, you know, lives, right? So life and death, I, I understand why people are resistant to change. It's not the core focus of these healthcare practices um, and the risks are high. And we found ourselves in a, in a perfect time and place to, to deliver this impact in a nice package that is digestible and palatable for, for healthcare practices. Well, I'm glad to hear that, right? And I, and I, I wanna come back a little bit later to this notion of change is hard. You know, there's the buzzwords, there's the innovator's dilemma, there's all kinds of, of um, kind of stuff going on here. But for now, let's start a little bit about your origin story, right? You've got family that is in and around the medical community, but how did you get started? This is a, this is a little bit of an esoteric project in some ways. Totally, and it's absolutely not my background or training, you know, healthcare supply chain tech. Um, my mom's a nurse, a nurse practitioner. My dad's a, a scientific researcher in the healthcare space. Um, and when I began my foray into, into this industry, I was a student at UPenn and I was sitting in my dorm room. COVID had just broke out. Uh, classes were on hold and I'm seeing, you know, horror stories related to supply chain failures and shortages and price gouging all over the news and it's being spoken about by my parents on every you know sunday dinner time zoom call we were having so i got involved out of as, as an emotional response and a feeling of necessity to protect the people that i care about and, and love and our we were we were desperate to provide any value or solution to what felt like the biggest problem i had experienced in in my life and the biggest threat that me and my friends and co-founders had experienced, you know, in our lives. Um, so we did exactly what our, our teachers would want us to do. We cracked open our books and our laptops and started looking at different data sets that uh, the school and uh, you know different different classmates had 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 come across in our academic journeys. Awesome. Well, and and where did that lead you? You were cracking this open. You were looking at data sets. What did you discover? Yeah, so we got our hands on publicly available data provided by the U.S. government that details the import records, basically in real time. It's just a few days off. The import records of every medical device, every medical supply into the U.S. Um, by doing that, we're able to see during a time of great shortage, during a time of great disruption, who is actively receiving and holding the much needed medical supplies in their hands in the U.S. Where is it coming in and basically who can deliver it to, to people like my mom. And with that information, we were able to, you know, contact those people, connect them to my mom's, my mom's, uh, my mom's office and word started spreading through what is now known to be, you know, the, the grapevine, uh, to, I think, that, that I think we, we just got able... the origin story, by the way, yeah. of the name. That's, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. So, so it started spreading that we were able to, you know, help get, these different healthcare practices and supplies they need when their 200 year old distributors and, and suppliers were, were struggling. So that was, that was our initial project. It wasn't a business. We were just doing things to help and yeah, didn't have an LLC and certainly weren't making any money, but 
Shortly thereafter, we end up getting a end up getting a, a call from one of these two hundred year old companies who had become aware that we were servicing their customers. I mean, and those are their words, not ours. I didn't think of them as customers or service right at the time. Um, but you know, relieving the the struggles of the pandemic for for these healthcare practices, and that they wanted to buy supplies from us. So now this was becoming a little more business and, and transactional. We got on. Uh, legal Zoom, registered an LLC and a bank account as fast as we could, um, and started receiving huge purchase orders. And that was the first red flag that there were that there were bigger problems in this space, right? When yeah. a couple of college dorm room kids start receiving millions of dollars from one of the biggest and oldest companies in America, to me, you know. It indicates that there's an opportunity to to change things for the better. Absolutely. So through that journey, we end up seeing a lot of inefficiencies, a lot of problems, a lot of embodied costs that are carried all the way through to the doctor and, of course, the patient. Um, and that was our inspiration to to take a take a deep breath, take a step back, and start with a blank slate blank slate, a fresh whiteboard, um, and, you know, dream big. And, and that dream becomes what, what Grapevine is today. If we could at the time, or if we were able to reinvent the entire healthcare supply chain, modernizing it um, and cutting out all these costs, what would it look like? Yeah. Uh, and, and, well, and, and these costs, like, like, I mean, I, I can't wait to see what you can do with this, right? Because these costs, it's not just, it's not just middlemen. It's not just brokers and markups that, are adding to the cost, right? Uh, you were telling me a little bit earlier about everything from wastage at the point of utilization to you know being unable to predict. Like, tell me more about some of what you're looking at. Yeah, absolutely. So on on the one side, I'll I'll talk. I'll break it into two categories for you. There's before it gets to the doctor's office, and then there's once it's in the doctor's office. And both of those places or both of those buckets there's huge opportunities to cut down costs. So before it gets there, I mean, when we were working with these, these age old distributors, they're having us ship things four or five times before it gets into the hands of the end user. We're watching it move right through the country in these ridiculous patterns, all for the sake of like outdated bureaucratic systems. When you ship something like needles or syringes or, you know, IV catheters or whatever it may be, right? In the healthcare space, every time you ship it, it costs about 20% the cost of the product, right? So if yeah. I'm going to ship that five times, it, it's not about greed or money. It's about it's about to cover your butts, to be able to not lose money on the delivery of these supplies to the end users. You've got to mark it up, you know, yep. at least 100%. Um, and that's what a lot of these sort of distributors are doing. It's huge inefficiencies that are leading to increased costs for people like you and me, Ian. On the other hand, you know, Grapevine's able to help doctors actually within their practice, right? So we can actually see in in enough detail to know per patient visit, you know, these different nurses or these different locations are using four needles per patient visit instead of one needle per patient visit, right? And those sort of insights, the cause, it could be they're over ordering, they're leaving stuff in, in the closet and it's never getting used and it's expiring. In some cases, that's exactly the cause. In other cases, you've got physicians or nurses or you know practitioners that are practicing medicine in an ugly way. And it's as much as a, a couple of training sessions on how to poke the needle right that can cut down your cost significantly. So Grapevine you know, is there to not only connect all of your vendors into one screen and introduce you to the vendors that you, you don't yet know you need, um, but also point out sort of behavioral problems uh, within the practice itself, overuse, misuse, um, and standardize the way that your patients receive patient care. Well, and I love that because I think that points to one of those really interesting things about change and innovation is that there's often these second order impacts that may or may not be expected. Mm -hmm.